Hi folks, good to be with you. Um, just making a little bit of dinner, and uh, I'm not out today. I've got things to do at home. So I'm going to be busy for uh, a week or so, so I won't be around much on uh, YouTube. And uh, so this is a little treat for you guys and girls. Don't forget my website, jasonburnspreacher.com, and don't forget um, Facebook and Twitter as well. And also the Royal Blood Ministries website, which I'll put stuff on every now and again. So I've got a few things to talk about that I'd like to share with you. I didn't used to have coffee, you know, but I'm really enjoying coffee at the moment. So, I'm going to um, just have a few thoughts on Christology and uh, just uh, on Christology and uh, we're down at Hyde Park in two weeks time so if you want to meet us down there if you're an evangelist or a preacher or a pastor we're going to be there uh, at the end of September so if you want to find out more details of us when we're going to be down there give me a ring uh, at, on my jasonburnspreacher.com if you give me a ring or send me a text and if you're an evangelist or pastor or a preacher and you want to meet up with us in Hyde Park um, let me know and you can join forces with us. It'd be good to have you. So, I'm just going to make myself a coffee. He is Lord, he is Lord. He is risen from the dead. He is Lord. I would highly recommend this. This is really, really nice. That's the first time I've ever had it. It's Pinda Colada Juice Drink and uh, it's pineapple, coconut, white grape and lemon and it's very 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 refreshing I'd encourage, I don't know where I uh, got it from uh, is that Aldi? yeah Aldi ok really really good I just took a swig of that absolutely gorgeous so we're making a uh, coffee and I've got a few things to share with you. terrible what's happening in the world at the moment with all the uh, hurricanes and all the rest of it. Really, really bad. Very, very sad. Bible warns though, in the last days there'll be earthquakes and all the rest of it. Okay, the Bible warns about that. So we're just making some sandwiches here, ham sandwiches. And then we'll get on to talk about some things. Um, we're going to talk about Christology. Okay. So we will get there, folks. We will get there. 
So, so uh, yeah, it's been terrible on the news. Very, very bad. Very, very bad. Um, Da, 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 do, do. I've got some books to recommend you. I got some books uh, to recommend. So we got our coffee, we got our our sandwiches, and uh, I won't eat them here on on live on uh, YouTube. Uh, I'll put them there. We'll have them in a minute. Got my Christology notes and uh, yeah, so it's three books to recommend. Okay, if you get these books, I guarantee they will bless you. Now, the first book is this book Martin Luther by Stephen Nicol, published by Presbyterian and Reform. Now, it's the anniversary of the uh, Reformation this year, so. You know, you need to be reading up on the Reformation, what it was all about. Reading John Calvin, reading Luther. This book, Stephen J. Nicol, which is not mine, which is my sister's. Uh, Presbyterian and Reformed, just in case she sees it. <laughs> Presbyterian and Reformed. Um, Martin Luther Stephen J. Nichols. Um, Martin Noll says, since Luther published and printed work about every two weeks of his adult life, there's a lot of ground to cover, but Nichols knows the terrain well and opens up his treasure with a deft touch. Sinclair Ferguson, I, I respect Sinclair Ferguson very highly. And he says, a marvellous mixture of biography, history, theology, and antidote. If you don't feel the heartbeat of the Reformation of these pages, check your pulse. Please, 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 get hold a copy of that and have a read of it this year. Okay, it will really bless you, really encourage you. Then the next one, a, a guy who I really love and respect is Joel Beakey. Joel Beakey, uh, he, he is the principal of uh, Puritan and Reformed Theological Seminary. I love this guy, I really do. He's written some amazing books. This one is on the Epistle of John, published by Evangelical Press. Uh, this will really, really bless your socks off. Really spiritually, practical minded, Joel Beakey. I would advise you to get hold of that book and have a read of it this year, Evangelical Press, Exit Launch. Now, this is another book, uh, Taking God at His Word by Kevin DeYoung. Kevin DeYoung, uh, published by IVP. I'd recommend you to get hold of this book, especially if you're a young Christian and you need encouragement in the Christian faith. This is an excellent book to get hold of, Taking God at His Word. Kevin D. Young. He is now assistant professor or assistant lecturer at Reformed Theological Seminary in Systematic Theology. Um, yeah, so Kevin D. Young, uh, Taking God at His Word, uh, excellent book. D. A. Casson says everything Kevin D. Young writes is biblical, timely, and helpful for both life and ministry. No, that was Rick Warren. <laughs> You might not agree with Rick Warren, uh, his writings, but that's what he says about De Young. David Platt, who I really admire, I admire David Platt a lot, says, My trust in God's word is greater, my submission to God's word is deeper, and my love for God's word is sweeter as a result of reading this book. I cannot recommend it highly enough. David Platt is a great guy, great guy, I love that guy. Don Carson, buy this book by the case and distribute copies to elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, and anyone in the church who wants to understand a little better what the Bible is. Kevin E. Young is Senior Pastor of University Reformed Church in East Lansing, Michigan. He is a popular blogger and the author of several accoladed, acclaimed books. Now, I'll give you some snippet of, of the book. Titles, Believing, Feeling and Doing, Something More Sure, God's Word is Enough. Chapter 4, God's Word is clear. Chapter 5, God's Word is final. Chapter 6, God's Word is necessary. Chapter 7, Christ's unbreakable Bible. 
and chapter 8 stick with the scriptures. Uh, so, really, really good book to read that. Get hold of it. Pass it to young people in the church. Buy copies of it and give them to young people and people in the church and it'll be a real blessing. It'll really encourage them. So, I'm just going to have a bit of my coffee, guys. So, I want to talk about uh, Christology. Um, yeah. I want to quickly just talk about Christology and uh, share my notes on that. Um, we're going down to Hyde Park and so this, this video is basically for um, helping people to defend their faith at Hyde Park. So this is for any apologists down at Hyde Park who are Christian to know how to answer Muslims. It's also for Christians who need encouraging in their faith and strengthening in their faith. Uh, and, and we're going to look at Christology or, or, some, or uh, a bit of teaching on the doctrine of who Christ is, who, who our Lord is. So I'm going to pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your blessings. We give you the prayers. We give you the glory. And Father, we just pray as we just share some thoughts right now on Christology. I just pray that you bless for your glory. And that, Father, it be a real blessing to people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I hope it's going to be a blessing to you. So, at Hyde Park, get my coffee, I'll eat my sandwiches off camera. So, at Hyde Park, there's a guy called Paul Williams, who's a Muslim apologist. And he goes round, and he, he attacks the Trinity. And when he attacks the Trinity, he's using scholars, academic scholars, who, who are not Trinitarian, and he's using those scholars. So... We're going to talk about that. So, there is a duplicity, a duplicity in Muslim apologetics. What they tend to do is they tend to use Western scholars who critique and attack orthodoxy. But yet in their own countries, in their own nations, in their own communities, they will not allow criticism of the Quran. And yet, they will take Western scholars who have criticised the Bible and they will turn those scholars onto Christians. And orthodoxy. There's a duplicity and a dishonesty there. And no more do you see that with Paul Williams. Paul Williams will go around Hyde Park and he'll say, oh, do you believe in the Trinity? Well, look at this passage in Chronicles. Look at uh, Solomon. Uh, the, the people bow before God and they bow before Solomon. So therefore, uh, they're worshipping Solomon, but Solomon's not God. So just because they worship Jesus does not mean that Jesus is God. Now, this sounds very plausible. But what Paul Williams is doing is he's using a certain scholar called, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, yeah, uh, Daniel Kirk, uh, Daniel Kirk, or a uh, Dr. Kirk, he's using Dr. Kirk as a uh, book, A Man Attested by God, The Human Jesus in the Synoptics. So, Paul Williams is using Dr. Kirk's work, okay? He's using Dr. Kirk's work. So, and Dr. Kirk is critiquing orthodoxy. Now, let, let, let's just unpack this now. Dr. Kirk is pro-gay. He's, he's a pro-LGB activist. He's a theologian that is a pro-LGB activist. So, he's written this book about the Christology of Jesus, of who Jesus is, to try and reduce Jesus to just being a man, so that that will give him a platform to build on his LGB rights agenda. Now Paul Williams, a Muslim apologist, turns up at Hyde Park and uses Dr. Kirk's scholarship, but he's not telling people the background of Dr. Dr. Kirk's scholarship. Alright? Now, this is an important book that's been written, A Man Attested by God, The Human Jesus uh, of the Synoptics, by uh, Dr. Kirk. I think it's Daniel Kirk, um, but I've got here J.R. Kirk, so we'll say Dr. Kirk. 
Now this book, published by Grand Rapids, is a very important book. Now, it's not as, as having an impact as the Muslim apologists claim. The Muslim apologists, like Dr. Uh, uh, Paul Williams, claim that this book is having a big impact amongst evangelicals. That's not true. That's not true. But it is having some impact. It has had some impact. And this book is important in, in the sense that it is a very, very scholarly work. Now, I've not read all the book, so I have to hold my hands up. I've read a quarter of the book and I've done some intensive research. When I've studied this quarter of his book, I've gone and looked at the, uh, some of the ancient texts that uh, Dr. Uh, Kirk brings out. Now the first thing about his book that is important to, is he says this, he brackets, he brackets Paul's epistles as not being relevant for this, for this, for this uh, piece of scholarly work that he's done. So he's, he's saying, look, we're going to look at the synoptics, Matthew, Mark and Luke, but we're not going to be involved with looking at, um, at uh, Paul, right? Now... That's fair enough, if he wants to look at the synoptics, he's, he's entitled to do that. But what he's not entitled to do is bracket the evidence out of the picture just because it doesn't suit him. You see, he brackets out Paul's epistles, but then he'll look at the widest field of Judaism, uh, like uh, the Book of Jubilee and other, other ancient Jewish texts, but he won't be looking at Paul. So there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an intellectual method there that's dishonest and is setting up the argument you know Paul's epistles are important because they're the earliest source material that we have about the Christology of Jesus so so if we have this Christology of Jesus by the Apostle Paul which is round about what AD 55 or even earlier and these are the, our earliest sources of who Jesus was Christologically speaking and, and there's high Christology there, i.e. Christology about Jesus being God, then when we're going to be looking at the uh, synoptics, uh, it, it opens up the possibility that as we're looking at the synoptics, there could possibly be high Christology, i.e. Christology that talks about Jesus being God. It opens us up to be open to that possibility. But if you bracket out Paul, it closes you off from that possibility. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, so the second thing is, is that Dr. Kirk then has a theory, and he calls it the idealized human. And, and basically, what Dr. Kirk is saying is that there is an idealized human motif throughout ancient literature, and we see this in the New Testament. So the idea is that the idealized human is a human who has divine properties but is not God. D d divine identity but is not God so anything that indicates that Jesus is divine within the New Testament does not necessarily from Dr. Kirk's point of view does not necessarily mean that Jesus is God he's just an idealized human so he has this motif what he calls the idealized human and then he goes back into ancient literature he goes back and looks at uh, Arcadian literature. He, he looks back at Jew, Jew, Jewish literature. And he looks back and he looks at motifs in the Old Testament, such as Adam, uh, Adam and Elijah and Moses, etc. Now, the, the point that I want to get at here is his motif, his motif is the hermeneutic that he's going to use to in interpret ancient literature. And that's a bad mistake because what, what that does is because he uses this motif uh, of idealized human, he then goes into ancient literature and that's all he wants to see and that's all he will see no matter what the literature is about, that's what he'll see. So for example, he mentions a uh, cuneiform text of, of the Arcadian religion, the Arcadian, Arcadian religion. The Arcadia is, Arcadian religion are the, are the uh, Syrian and then the Babylonian Empire and, 
Um, and then before the Syrian Empire, there was the Arcadian religion that stretched these empires. So it mentions a few cuneiforms of kings who, who have been worshipped, who were seen as divine, but they are not divine. And then he says, from that point of view, look, we see the Arcadian religion, we see the kings worshipped, we've looked at a few cuneiform texts, and uh, Bob's your uncle, therefore, when we read the New Testament, we see about Jesus, he's not really God, they worship him, well, they worship Arcadian kings, so what's the big deal? Jesus was just a man who was idolised. He was not God, but he was an idolised human. Uh, Dr. Hurtado, who is uh, an eminent scholar uh, in uh, Christ uh, early Christianity, has noted that uh, Dr. Kirk um, is his method is dubious. He points out and, 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 and takes him to task for bracketing out Paul's epistles, saying that this was not a fair methodology. But he also takes him to task for his quotations of ancient literature because he's doubtful whether these ancient texts mean what Dr. Kirk is saying. So Hotado points out that when um, when uh, Dr. Kirk is quoting from um, in the Book of Enoch and, and saying, look, there are people being worshipped here, but they're not God. Otardo points out that these are ambivalent and, and it's not clear. And he's making more of an argument from this than it can be substantiated. Here's the point that is very important. Let's go back to the Arcadian situation. So Dr. Kirk quotes a couple, just a few quick cuneiform texts of kings. I mean, only a handful, not many. He quotes only a handful. So I'll give you an example of how you've got to be wary of these kind of critical scholars. He quotes only a handful, right? Now we're talking, now we're talking of thousands of years, thousands of years of the history of one religion, the Arcadian religion. The Arcadian religion. Over thousands of years, over a number of empires, to the point that one scholar, one eminent scholar whose name has, has left me, but one eminent scholar in this field said, it's very difficult to define what the Arcadian religion is. There are so many complex, interchangeable uh, factors within the Akkadian, Akkadian religion over thousands of years. Uh, for example, the complexity of um, sometimes there were gods uh, related to cities and um, then there were religious practices that we, we don't fully understand or fully know. And so it, it's very difficult and then empires come and go and, it's, and, and then each empire emphasizes certain gods above other gods. And, and, it, and it's very difficult to define what the Akkadian religion is because it's so complex and varied over the thousands of years. So you, as a scholar, coming around and just quoting five or six cuneiform texts and saying this is what the Akkadian, Akkadian religion is, is a, is a travesty. But the popular mind, the mindset of the public, the Christian public, will read what he said about the Akkadian religion, Dr. Kirk, and say, look, they, they worshipped their kings, therefore, uh, he was an, they were idolised humans, therefore, Adam, uh, Jesus, is an idolised human, therefore he's not God. Well, slip, flip it the other side, wait a minute, his quote of a handful of Akkadian texts does not, in any shape or form, give us any, uh, is not a real understanding of the Akkadian religion, which stretches over thousands of years. This is very simplistic. And, and, and not very profound scholarship. And then even, it gets even worse because he quotes these Arcadian texts, but I did some research on these various gods. What struck me with these gods is it, what, it was a polythe polytheistic re religion with a variety of gods. There was no, there's no mention in Dr. Kirk's book of the nuance of what that would mean in terms of his, quote, idolized human. So, what we're seeing here is we have an eminent scholar, Dr. Kirk, who's a, who's a brilliant scholar, has written a 500-page book, 
on Christology and he quotes a few cuneiform texts at the beginning of his book. His, his argument, his book is not based on the Akkadian religion, by the way. That, that, that's like a, a small snippet, all right? We have to be fair. He then goes on to Adam, he goes on to Moses, he goes on to um, Elijah, then he goes on to uh, Jewish other texts such as uh, the Book of Jubilee, the Dead Sea Scrolls, etc. All I'm pointing out is whenever he goes to these sections, he's only picking out and cherry picking the little bit of scholarship that he can find to prove text what he's trying to say. But it's too simplistic because the issues that he's tackling require a much more profounder scholarship and uh, in-depth study of the various topics that he's making. He's only covering things on a surface level. And he's taken this uh, idealised human uh, motif and he's imposing it on ancient texts to prove his point. That they're not actually in most cases they're not actually there some cases but most cases they're not actually there in the text but his motif is is trying to impose it upon those texts Dr. Kirk does interact with other scholars I give him that Dr. Kirk does interact with Richard Balcom, Hurtado, he does interact with other scholars. This guy is a top scholar, there's no doubt about it, he's a brilliant scholar and he, he, he does engage in, um, in, in dealing with other scholars, you know, and he does, I think he does in, in a fair way, uh, he, he tackles scholars who agree, disagree with him and, and I give him credit for that. So, so what does this mean? Well, what does this mean in practice? Well, for example, Paul Williams, when he's in um, the Muslim Apologist, when they're at Hyde Park, Paul Williams will use Dr. Kirk's scholarship and he'll say, look, uh, so he's got, Paul Williams has got the idealised human motif in his mind. So, he'll quote a passage from Solomon, uh, the... Uh, chronicles and you say look uh, they bowed and worshipped before God and Solomon therefore therefore Jesus is not God because the worshipping Solomon Solomon's not God so if they worship Jesus doesn't mean to say he's God now that passage particular passage is not clear it is not saying that Solomon is to be worshipped the context is quite clear. It's worshipping God, but out of respect, Solomon, who is a servant of God, gets respect too. But it doesn't mean he gets the worship. But what, what is important here is the whole, and this is what Dr. Kirk has done, and this is what Paul Williams does, fails to, to, to look at the whole context of Judaism. Judaism, in the Old Testament, well, or from the, the, the Jewish scripture, or the uh, look at it from Jewish people even, of the ancient times, or, or um, yeah, uh, just, just looking at the Old Testament, whichever way you define it, is monotheistic, it, it is monotheistic, it is one God. So that is the whole culture, so when he takes the text and says, look, they're bowing and worshipping for Joseph, uh, before uh, Solomon and God, so why they worshipping Solomon? If you took the whole context of the religion of that time, they believed in one God. So he's obviously uh, imposing the Kirkian, Dr. Kirk's motif of an idolised human within that text and not looking at the whole religion. And that's what uh, Dr. Kirk does in his scholarship. He goes to various ancient texts and, and doesn't really extrapolate what the whole religion of that particular culture actually believe. And then, because he doesn't have the wider context, he just goes to a specific text and extrapolates what he wants from that, his, ideal, his uh, idolised human motif. So, 
I think that, I think, yeah. Uh, I think if, it, if it's, I think if we just go to uh, one chronicle, so one chronicles. Uh, one chronicles uh, twenty nine. Verse twenty. Yeah, no, sorry about that, sorry about that. I thought that was the passage. So, so that's uh, Dr. Kirk. So, so basically, when you're reading academic books, and this is for academics as well, this is for uh, academic scholars as well, for, for those who, uh, who are academics, maybe people who were doing, young people who were doing PhDs in, in, in theology or, or scholarship, biblical scholarship, uh, but also for Christians um, who were just reading uh, books as lay people. i give you a piece of advice. You've got to find out the scholar's methodology because the scholar's methodology will lead to the conclusions. Okay? His methodology, Dr. Kirk's methodology, He's already setting up the answer that he wants. His methodology is, look, I'm pro-gay. I don't particularly want orthodoxy in the church because it's against my LGB rights. How do I get rid of orthodoxy? Well, we need to look at Jesus and destroy his authority. He's no longer God. He's a man. How do I prove that he's a man? I have a motif that he's an idolized human. And I'll go into ancient literature and I'll look at ancient literature and find my motif. And when I find my motif, I can then say, look, in all the ancient literature, there's this motif of an idolized human. And therefore, when we read the New Testament, particularly the Synoptic Gospels, hey, guess what? Jesus is an idolized human. He then says, and I have to be fair to him, I'm not criticising Paul. I'm not criticising the rest of the New Testament. Maybe there is high Christology, that Jesus is God. But let's just look at the synoptic issue. And maybe, just maybe, we've got it wrong. But what he did is he bracketed out Paul's epistles and he pushed out other information of the New Testament that might actually give him a... A, a, a historical basis and this is the problem he doesn't want to look at things historically giving his uh, analysis of ancient uh, of, of the synoptic gospels from a historical perspective how the the nature of the deity of Christ developed within the New Testament rather than seeking the importance of looking at Paul's epistles for this uh, historical development push that evidence out, have my motif and look at ancient literature and impose my motif on them and then bring that information onto the synoptic gospels, impose that information on the synoptic gospels and then tell you that Jesus is not God but idolised man, which fits my agenda because I'm into uh, LGB rights and I want to minimise the impact that Jesus has on the church in terms of being God. So your method, your method dictates your conclusions. Now you as a lay person will read Dr. Kirk and think, oh, this is amazing, amazing scholarship. But you've got to get, you've got to grapple, grasp the method, okay? And this is an important thing <coughs> as a PhD student and as, a, and as an academic in scholarly work. <coughs> if you go into a hospital ward, where there is E. coli and all sorts of diseases, um, the plague and all sorts of diseases on the ward, and you just go and sit next to someone who's got the plague, and then you go next to somebody else who's got the plague, and you go and sit next to somebody else who's got the plague, you will inevitably get the plague. You'll catch it. 
And a lot of you PhD students, a lot of you academics out there, you're so imbibed in academic scholarship that you've caught various academic diseases without realising it. You, you've taken on presuppositions without any real critical thinking. So, for example, one critical, one means, one, one disease that you'll catch as a PhD student is the Gospel of John. It's not historical. There's no historical information in the Gospel of John, or very little. And that goes back to the fact that there have been presuppositions such as Hegelian philosophy, um, since Bauer and, and, and all the rest of it, where they've looked at it from a philosophical point of view concerning the Gospels. And so they bracketed it out saying the Gospel of John is not historical. But that was a presupposition of philosophy imposed onto a text. And then that is kept there uh, uh, academically for, for over a hundred years and you come as a PhD student, you come as a scholar, you're studying and you imbibe that attitude before you even begin. So you're never ever going to look at the Gospel of John uh, as, a, as having any real historical significance in your scholarship. You've been, you, 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 were, you have taken on a presupposition without any real critical thinking. And um, so you need to be aware as PhD students, you need to be aware as scholars, how much you've been infected by academia. And you need to, you need to get back to more of a, a robust biblical theology. You need to be reading Herman Bavinck's Reformed Dogmatics. You need to be reading uh, Adel Schlatter's works. You need to be reading um, Theodore Zahn's works. You need to be reading... Um, well, uh, try, just trying to think. You need to be reading... Uh, Theodore Zahn, uh, Adel Schlatter, uh, Herman Bavinck. Um, just trying to think. You need to. There's a guy called John Lightfoot, a bishop uh, in the 19th century, who, who did uh, patristic work in a very, very uh, solidly uh, scholarly way. That's the kind of scholarship that you need to be doing. Uh, a scholarship that's aware of the presuppositions around. Uh, but is is thoroughly, thoroughly committed to the Word of God, and, and thoroughly committed to the honour of God, and thoroughly committed to 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 Christ as our Saviour. But if you allow your if, if you allow yourself to be um, influenced by various academic presuppositions, then you 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 you're inevitably going to write works that actually undermine the Christian faith. There are scholars today who are evangelical, and God bless them, they mean well, they've written some very, very great scholarly works, but at the same time they also undermine the, the Christian faith because, because they've imbibed so much of the academic presuppositions that there'll be certain statements that they make. So for example, we have um, one eminent apologist who says that the passage where it talks about uh, uh, coming out of the grave, uh, people coming out of the grave at the resurrection of Jesus, at the time of the resurrection of Jesus, that that is not historical, but that's myth. Uh, that, that's because they've taken on certain presuppositions of academia. The intellectual tools that we interpret scripture, uh, academia has a whole variety of them, read a response and uh, all sorts of uh, postmodern ways of reading scripture. And you as an academic can be so involved in all these hermeneutical methods that you bring to bear on the scripture, but then in the end you're not really allowing the scripture to speak for itself. Uh, but you don't realise that because you're so enthralled with all the academic sparkle of the various intellectual tools that you've gathered over the many years that you've been studying in an academic format. I think sometimes as academics you need to just leave, go on holiday for a, a month and go and read some good solid orthodox literature and get refreshed and get back to what it's all about. Go and read John Calvin's Institutes and John Calvin's uh, 
uh, commentaries uh, and, and get back to what it's all about. So, and for lay people, you, you're always going to be, as a lay person, not sideways. If you, if you keep getting these popular books that scholars write, like Bart Ehrman and other scholars, and critique the Bible, you're always going to get not sideways because you don't realize their methodology is not right. Their methodology is already anti-Christian. It's anti-Bible. So, for example, Bart Ehrman, he write books and books. Bart Ehrman, all as Bart Ehrman's doing is taking on the scholarship of Dr. Bauer. Dr. Bauer believed there was no one truth, that there was no one specific orthodoxy. That was his theory. And now, Bart Ehrman writes many popular works based on this theory. And you get his work and you think, oh, Bart Ehrman's amazing, he's criticising the Bible, it must be right. Not realising that his presuppositions and his methodology was got from Dr. Bauer. <clears throat> so when a scholar comes on TV and does a documentary, or when a scholar writes a book about Jesus, <coughs> they'll have an agenda, they'll have a specific <coughs> methodology. And you need to find out that methodology, find out about this scholar. Don't listen to their story, but find out information of where they're at. Have they imbibed some kind of philosophy? Have they got some kind of agenda? And then that will help you to get a grip of what they're actually saying. All right? <coughs> Excuse me. So another book on Christology. So another uh, book on Christology that's very helpful to counteract Dr. Kirk. Dr. Kirk's book is A Man Attested by God, the Human Jesus of the Synoptics, J.R. Kirk, I think it's Daniel Kirk, but J.R. Kirk, Grand Rapids 2016. Alright? But if you type in A Man Attested by God, the Human Jesus, Dr. Kirk, 2016, Grand Rapids, you can get hold of that book, you can go and read it. <coughs> um, it's quite a, a scholarly work. And I'm reading through it. I've still got uh, more work to do on that book. All right, but it's good to grapple with ideas that are different from you. You see, the, 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 there's a there's a theory going around that orthodox people don't read scholarship against their position. Well, I'm reading this book, and I'm always reading books that are against the orthodox position. I think it's good to find out what people are saying against the orthodox position, so that we can critique what they're saying and see if they're bringing anything to the table that's helpful uh, for the discussion and debate. So, a book that is the flip side and a much more profound scholarly work than Dr. Kirk's is the Cambridge scholar um, J. Garther Cole. I think it's, yeah, G-A-T-H-E-R-C-O-L-E. Simon J. Garth Cole, Gather Cole, G A T H E R C O L E. His book is called The Pre Existent Son. <coughs> the Pre Existent Son. The Pre Existent Son, published by Erdmans. It's a very, very, very uh, scholarly work. I think it's much more profound than Dr. Kirk's. Because uh, Garther Skoll really, really, really uh, interacts in a nitty gritty way with various opinions. It's very intricate scholarship, much, much more intricate than this. this. Dr. Kirk is a big, is a more broad canvas, and I think he's done the work on a broad canvas for others to do detailed work on what he's saying. But what uh, Garther Skoll has done is giving you detailed. Uh, analysis and what his argument is basically there is um, information in the synoptic gospels that show that Jesus is God and uh, we'll look at some of that information so he goes into uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 uh, and so now his methodology 
is completely different from Dr. Kirk's. You remember Dr. Kirk, I won't go into detail what he said, but he bracketed out Paul's epistles. Now here, before uh, Garthus Gall, Simon Garthus Gall gets into his book, The Pre-Existent Son, published by Erdmund, before he gets into the, 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 the meat of his book, he, he, uh, he, he, he just has a look at Paul's epistles and says, look, there's actually high Christology, Christology that's showing Jesus is God here, before we even start on the Synoptic Gospels. And we have to say this because Paul's epistles are the earliest source of who Jesus is uh, as the God-man. So he looks at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. So if we go to uh, Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to have to get my dinner in a minute, folks. We'll get there. Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 6 and 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 8. It says, Philippians uh, chapter 2, verse 6 and 8. It says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation, took upon himself uh, the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Uh, Gartha Skoll makes the point um, that here we have a pre-existent Christ that existed before and now comes from heaven, now comes to be a servant. And he looks at the scholarship that tries to get round this. There are scholars that have tried to, uh, I think like Dunn and others have tried to argue this away. And he says, well, it's quite clear, look. Let, it says, um, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. So there's a, there is a contrast between being in heaven and then coming down as a servant. And then if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8 verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. So it's a little bit weaker there in its expression of Jesus be existing before the beginning of history. Uh, but the idea is there, he was rich, now he's become poor, which is not exactly the same, but looking from the same kind of trajectory or perspective, as Philippians, where it says uh, he, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself with no reputation. If we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 47. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 47. Um, we... The first man is of the earth, the second man is the Lord from heaven. So there is a clear indication, the Lord from heaven, that Christ existed before he came to this earth. Romans 10, Romans 10. And Dr. Kirk, I think, acknowledges that there is this high Christology in Paul's epistles. I don't think he denies that. Uh, but Garth has called, uh, in Romans, um, excuse me, Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verse 6 and 9, says, But the righteousness which is of faith, speaking on this wise, say not to thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. But what is it 
the word is nigh even though uh, even in thy mouth and in thy heart that is the word of faith which we preach for if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and but shall believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved so Paul uh, sorry Simon Gatherskall is saying here there's an indication that Christ existed before because he says who shall Sorry, sorry, because it, 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 it indicates here, but the righteousness which is of faith, say not in thy heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what say the, the word is nigh, even thy mouth. So I think what Gatherskull is saying is that that is a, a descent from heaven passage there. Uh, I'm not so sure if it's as clear as 1 Corinthians 15 47 but what is significant is there in verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved. I mean that is a, I think that's what Gathered Skull is hinting at as well is the divinity of Christ there is that we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, for a, for, a, for a Jewish person of that time, that would tantamount to be blasphemy. We turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. It says, But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, the one Lord, Jesus Christ. So there's a question between God the Father and God the Son together. You know, one God and one Lord Jesus Christ, but they're mentioned in the same sentence and as equal. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. So here, it's showing that Christ has created everything, which means he's God. For by him were all things created that were in heaven, that in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. That's clearly not, as Dr. Kirk would want to say, an idolized human. That is clearly a statement that Jesus is God. And then if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, so 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that was Christ. So the Moses is drinking from the water, the people of God are drinking from the water that has come from God, and now Paul is saying that is from Christ. So Christ is God, God is Christ. So that's J. Garther's goal. He then goes in his book early on, he goes into uh, some exposition of the book of Hebrews. And then he goes into the book of the, the synoptics, and he shows in the synoptics there is high Christology, or Christology that shows that Jesus is God. Uh, if we go to Luke ten eighteen, Luke ten eighteen, this is a part. Uh, this is a passage that scholars are, are baffled about today in the academic world. They don't really know what to do with this passage. And uh, just to say that Garthus Gall is a very very profound scholar. He's actually. In theological seminaries and academic institutions in Germany, his book is required reading. So, I mean, if your book becomes required re reading in, in, in academic circles, then it shows that your book is quite significant. So it shows that his book is much more significant and is more orthodox. It's actually defending what we believe, the divinity of Christ. It's actually a book that is required reading in some academic institutions in Germany. Top academic academic institutions so so that's just a point there but if you go to Luke 10 18 Luke 10 18 Luke 10 18 it says 
And he said unto him, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. So here it is it's saying that Jesus before creation saw Satan fall like lightning. So that shows that he was more than a man, that he was God. And um, we turn to Mark. Oh, oh, yeah, he notes this. If we go to Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Uh, Mark, Matthew, Mark. Mark uh, chapter 3, 13. It says this, And he goeth unto a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. So, Gatherskull notes that the Lord Jesus chose his disciples, elected his people, all right? And um, so he notes that election, the, God, the choosing of people, is God's priority, prerogative. And so Jesus is doing the election here in that passage in, um, in, Math, in Mark chapter 3, verse 13. And he goeth up unto a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. So the election, the choosing of people is a prerogative of God, and yet Jesus is doing the election. I thought that was very interesting, and you can look at Luke chapter 6, verse 13. Luke chapter 6, verse 13. And put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed him. Um, I think he mentions that passage in showing that the power of Christ, that Christ, the fact that Christ, the Lord, could heal a person also shows that he's God. He not only did it with the instruction of the Father, but he did it sometimes where he just touched and that person was healed, showing that he had authority. That the Lord had power to forgive sins, Luke 7.49. Luke 7.49. Says, And they that sat in meat with him began to say with themselves, Who is this that forgives sins also? So the people were amazed that he could forgive sins. And they saw it as a prerogative of God. And yet he could forgive sins as God. If we go to Mark chapter 4, 35. Mark chapter 4, 35. And he came day when they even was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the side. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves heat, uh, heat beat into the ship, 